Welcome to History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave us a comment if you like this story. In the annals of Old West history, the topic of intertribal warfare is often overlooked. This is due to a variety of factors, not the least of which include both cultural biases and the lack of any substantive written record prior to European contact. However, tonight, we will be delving into a world seldom seen. A world that, though it had been influenced by New World trappings such as the horse and the firearm, still retained rivalries and blood feuds born long before contact with any European power had been made. This was war to the knife, with little to no concessions made for surrender or quarter of any kind. Long before the French, Spanish, English, or Dutch touched land on the North American continent, fights between tribes meant a win or die battle for all involved. Tonight, we take a look at one such fight between the Crow tribe and a group of Cheyenne warriors. The Bighorn Mountains, Northern Wyoming, 1819. In the late summer sunshine, 32 Cheyenne warriors wearily led their ponies north through the mountains on their way back to their home territory after a visit with the longtime allies of theirs, the Arapaho. As they crested a pine-covered ridge, they came upon a crow scout who, by the time they sighted him, was already attempting to make a desperate escape. The crow and the Cheyenne had been long feuding, and this crow scout had assuredly been sent out from a nearby village in order to keep tabs on the traveling party of Cheyenne. Unfortunately for that scout, this was a particularly unfortuitous meeting, as this group of Cheyenne were comprised mostly of what was known as dog soldiers or crooked lance soldiers. The latter name came from their weapon of choice, an 8-12 to 12 foot lance with a large shepherd's crook at the end. This could be used to run a buffalo or an enemy tribesman through, or to hook an opponent off their feet. However, for the dogmen, it had one additional use. A Cheyenne dogman was required to be an experienced warrior. He would then take an oath to the tribe to die rather than ever retreat in the face of the enemy. They were, essentially, the 300 Spartans of the Cheyenne tribe. Their lot was to fight or die, often done so with their lances staked into the ground, driven through a long sash connected to the warrior's bonnet. This was not only a symbolic gesture, but a literal restraint that forced the warrior to be true to his sacred word. These dog soldiers made quick work of running down the Crow Scout and filling him with arrows. However, in spite of their tactical experience, they had made a critical error. The Crow Scout had been part of a setup. Though he had been killed by the Cheyenne, and thus now relegated to the realm of martyrdom and away from his terrestrial constraints as a tactical pawn, he had served his purpose well. His job was not to fight the Cheyenne and win on his own, but to draw them deeper into Crow territory, where his cohorts lay ready to spring an ambush. Though he was not able to draw the Cheyenne all the way into the waiting crow envelopment, the killing of the crow scout delayed them long enough that they were quickly set upon by a larger party of crows. The Cheyenne quickly retreated to the top of the nearest hill, finding themselves surrounded on all sides despite seizing the high ground. Three other entire camps of crow lay in wait all throughout the surrounding mountains, maintaining a perimeter of sorts to cut off any hope the Cheyenne may have had of escape. Survival, it was now obvious, was not an option. Soon the Cheyenne horses were all dead or dying, having been shot down by crow arrows and bullets or having had their throats slit by their owners rather than be surrendered to their enemy. The Cheyenne too began to fall as many of them retreated to a small rocky outcropping not far from the summit of the hill. On the steep, rocky hillside, they would make their last stand. From here, with perhaps a dozen Cheyenne left alive, they peppered arrows down the hill as arrows and musket balls were lobbed up at them 
from seemingly all directions. One crow made several good shots in a row and was quickly making an ascent up the hill towards the rocks, ducking and darting from behind one boulder to the next. One of the Cheyenne possessing a rifle, a warrior named One-Eyed Antelope, spotted the crow weaving his way towards their position. He patiently waited until the crow's head bobbed above another boulder and then promptly blew his head off. The crow fell forward, splayed over a large rock. One-Eyed Antelope began to sing and cry out. Then, having reloaded his rifle, still singing, he took aim and shot another crow warrior, killing him. Again, One-Eyed Antelope sang and cried out, lauding his axe and encouraging his compatriots to fight on. Two more crows would die before One-Eyed Antelope himself was cut down by crow arrows. Soon, when the surviving Cheyenne were out of bullets and arrows, they were left with only the offensive use of their spears, knives, tomahawks, and clubs. The warriors sang their death songs as they made their final charge towards the crow lines, running down the hill, their weapons in hand, attempting to take any crow they could with them as they died. They were all shortly cut down by arrows, spears, bullets, and clubs. Then, they were all summarily mutilated, scalped, and left to be picked apart by the local scavenging wildlife. Anything of value on the bodies was taken, and then the crow knew all too well that it was time to pack up and move on quickly. They were a relatively small tribe, numbering perhaps a few thousand, and thus a comparative fraction of the size of the Cheyenne. Before the dog soldiers had ridden off in pursuit of the scout, they had sent a few younger warriors back as messengers to bring reinforcements. Eventually, those reinforcements would arrive, and as had been the case for a time immemorial on the plains, vengeance was taken and many lives were lost. Eventually, though, after decades, the Cheyenne and Crow would reconcile their longtime differences and become friendly. When they recalled the story of this battle, the Crow spoke of how one warrior had sung his death song while cutting down four of their men in a row. It was only then that the family of One-Eyed Antelope were able to find out what had really happened, when they were able to identify the Crow recreation of the song that was sung that day by some of the actual Crow warriors who had been there. One can only imagine how many thousands of times so many similar scenes went unrecorded and thus unregarded by the uninitiated that comprised the vast majority of Western society. Even in the 18th and 19th century, there was a tendency among those not living on the frontier to romanticize pre-European contact tribes as noble savages who had really attained a simultaneously simpler and more enlightened culture than the one that most living on America's eastern seaboard at the time had descended from. But ultimately, this was not reality. People are people, and the world, especially in the American West, was a harsh and unforgiving place. Life was short, brutal, and demanding. Conflict was constant, resources were scarce, and people were willing to kill or die to ensure the security and survival of those they loved. We will never know how many hard battles were fought and hard deaths died far from the prying eyes and printing presses of Western civilization. However, luckily, there are a number of other accounts from not only the Cheyenne, but other tribes that have passed down stories and recorded them via similar means, usually through passing them down verbally. We do know that the location was known from then on as Standing Crow Creek, or Crow Standing Off Creek, either in reference to the Cheyenne standing off the crow or to the Cheyenne crowing from their defenses after successfully killing their enemy combatants. The creek where the battle took place runs only miles away from where other famous battles, much more well known to history, like the Wagon Box fight and the Fetterman Massacre, took place decades later. But those are other stories for other times. And before we go, if you're anything like me, 
you probably don't have as much free time as you'd like to kick back, relax, and crack open one of the many books on your shelf that you bought and plan to read, but just haven't found time to get around to yet. Thankfully, I found Audible, the unrivaled audiobook platform. It allows me to do most of my research for this program directly from their app. If you're interested in doing your own deep dive on any of these topics that we've covered here on the podcast or any of our other podcasts, check out my reading list on alldamnnight.com. Every title listed there is available on Audible as well. Sign up for Audible using our link in the description or use promo code ALLDAMNIGHT in the checkout. That's promo code ALLDAMNIGHT. You'll get your first month completely free and that includes a credit for any audiobook you choose. Join Audible and you'll hear what you've been missing.